you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. So wonderful to be back with you. Um, always enjoy these times and these lovely songs. I thought I knew all the songs in the Redemption Hymnal, but we sang a couple tonight that I don't know, but um, they're worth singing. I've got another suggestion, maybe a little bit later on. I want to share something um, tonight, which is sort of foundational. It's not really complicated or especially deep, but it is really important. So I just wanted to touch this base here. Um, I'm thinking about words and the way that God uses words to communicate not just truth, but life in the spirit. But words, you know, are kind of tricky things. Words, all languages are kind of almost living things. They're changing all the time. So words which meant one thing at one point can sometimes mean quite the opposite in another time. I don't know whether it's so in other parts of the world, but when I was a boy, wicked meant evil. But now if you say wicked to teenagers, they think you mean it really is good. It's hip, it's cool, it's just the way it ought to be. So words keep changing their meaning. And that's why the Bible is so wonderful, because effectively it defines its own words and then keeps to that usage of them. Um, let me give you an illustration. If we were to take the word guilty in modern use, the word guilty is often used in sentences like, I cleared up the kitchen because I felt guilty or something like that. In the Bible, guilty is never used to describe a feeling. If you want a word to describe a bad feeling, that would be expressed with the word shame. Because the Bible, when it says guilty, means blameworthiness. It's the statement of a judge at the end of a court case, he's listened to the accusations that have been brought against someone and he's listened to the defense, if there is a defense. And then if he feels that person is guilty of the charge that's brought against him, then he will declare him guilty and then sentence him. So the word guilty in the Bible never means a bad feeling, although you'll find often in modern hymns and choruses, it's often used in that kind of sense, um, as is the word condemnation. It's used in the sense of you don't feel bad about this. Don't let people condemn you, brother. Don't be condemned. The Bible never uses condemnation in that way either. That would be the word accusation. Condemnation is the sentence when the judge declares it and the prisoner is taken away to his punishment, whatever that should be. The judge, you see, is not really concerned with how you feel. He's judging whether or not you committed the crime of which you were charged. Now, we use the word faith and believe in so many ways as well. I remember uh, an old Anglican joke. The Anglicans have some wonderful old jokes. And there was a, a, a joke about a young Anglican clergyman who was summoned to see his bishop. And he arrived somewhat nervous and late. And he said, I'm so sorry, my Lord. My watch has failed me. And I had such faith in my watch. Ah, oh, said the bishop, when it comes to watches, what you need is not faith, but good works. So what do we mean by faith? Let me illustrate something else. My father was an engineer. As a boy, uh, he taught me that the finest cars in the world were made by Rolls-Royce. I believe, I trusted him, I believe to this day that it's true. But that belief has never affected my life in any way at all. On one single occasion, I had a very brief journey in a Rolls-Royce, but it's, it's never set me longing for Rolls-Royce. It's, it's never touched me. It's just, it's just a belief. It kind of settles there somewhere in the back of my mind and becomes one of the assumptions of the way in which I think. Now, you could look up the word dictionary, the word faith in a dictionary. And in fact, I did so. Uh, and it, it, it said this in one of them. Just listen to this for a dictionary of faith. Faith or belief 
is a psychological state in which an individual holds a proposition or premise to be true without, with or without proof for such proposition. <laughs> or as it says, faith is a belief in something which has not been proven. Now, the Bible doesn't use the word faith in those kind of senses at all. And the wonderful thing is that often Bible words don't have definitions as such. What they have is histories. There are stories in the Bible which often are a perfect definition of the word. And the word is used in that story or the, the word is signified by that story. And it gives us something which really can grip our hearts. We think, yeah, I remember that story. This is where it comes from. Now, there's a Bible definition that we have in the scriptures, I believe. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it, it, it comes from a story in the Old Covenant scriptures. But this is how it starts. I'm, I'm turning to John chapter 3 and verse 12 to 17. This is the uh, <clears throat> this is the follow on from Jesus's uh, discussion with Nicodemus, and it's one of those passages of John's Gospel where I'm never sure whether it's Jesus who said this or whether it's John commenting and saying this. So I'll leave you to make your mind up anyway. So in John chapter three and verse twelve, it says, "If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe." That is this word believe. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And Paul, in his letter to the Romans, describes the gospel. He refers to it as my gospel. That doesn't mean he's kind of exercising the right over it and nobody else can use it. It, it. It's Paul's revelation, his own personal truth that God has opened his eyes to. And he says this in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Notice this reference to believing that came in the first reading and in this one. For the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. In this passage, this is Romans chapter 1 verse 16, you've got the word believe for everyone who believes, and then you've got this reference that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And in our English language, which is rich because it's borrowed world, words from all over the place, you sometimes have words which are, are so close to one another, but you wouldn't guess. And the word believe is the verb of the noun, which is faith. And in the Greek, you'd hear it because when it says believes, it's the word pistionti. That's the verb. And faith is pistios. So you can see there's a connection. So really, believing is the act of faith or is the process of faith, maybe under certain circumstances. And Paul goes on to say later on in Romans, this is chapter 10, and verse 13 now. He says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed. I don't know whether you noticed that, but earlier on, when we read that passage from John, it says, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then that whoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have eternal life. So this is not just believing in facts. This is believing in a person. It's putting your trust in an individual. Faith really is a relationship between two people. One who has the truth, who has the life, and the other one who believes with all their heart that that is true and consequently trusts their life to him. There's an old story. I'm sure I've told you this story maybe a dozen times already <laughs> on this channel. A man named Blondel. He was a Frenchman. He was an acrobat and a very clever man and a real showman. And uh, he used to do exploits and gather great crowds and then take up a collection afterwards. And on one occasion, he actually spot a rope, a tight rope or a tight right high wire, whatever you want to call it, that stretched from America to Canada. And he was going to do some of his exploits on this rope. And he began by walking over the rope, just holding his balancing bar. And then he came back. And then that was that was kind of dramatic enough when you think of what would have happened if he had fallen. There was no safety net. But then he came back and he had uh, prepared a bicycle. And this bicycle had had the rubber tires taken off it so that you just had the metal wheels. And he got on the bicycle, still using his balancing pole, and he cycled across the high wire from America to Canada and back again. And all the people who were around him were cheering and hooting and uh, clapping. Um, and it continued like this. I'm not making these up. This, this man was a brilliant um, acrobat and was very was world famous. In fact, on one occasion, with one of these kind of things, he actually took with him onto the middle of the high wire what we in England call a paraffin stone, which I what I think in America they call a kerosene stone. I have stove. I've got no idea what you call it in Canada or elsewhere. But he took a kerosene stove and he fried for himself an omelette in the middle of this wire, halfway between America and Canada, and ate it before he continued his journey. I mean, this almost sounds unbelievable, but it's not unbelievable. It actually happened. And then he did something else. He had a wheelbarrow where the wheel had been specially prepared again so that it wouldn't kind of bounce off the wire. And he filled it with sacks of potatoes. And then he wheeled this heavy wheelbarrow across the wire into Canada and back again. And by this time, the people were kind of going out of their minds with excitement. They were clapping and shouting and all the rest of it whistling. And then he said this, this we've come to the punchline now. <clears throat> he said, do you believe I could carry a man in my wheelbarrow across to Canada and back again? And they all let loose and they, they said yes they cheered they shouted they clapped their hands yes they said yes and Blondell said can I have a volunteer and it all became very quiet because they believed he could do it but they weren't prepared to put their lives into his hands and when the Bible speaks about faith it's not talking about truths that are ideas that we have in our minds that we are giving a mental agreement to. When it talks about faith, it's talking about this kind of belief in which you risk everything. You put all your eggs in one basket and you take your life in your hands and commit it into the hands of somebody else. That's faith. This is what Paul says in Romans. He says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Notice the logic here of what Paul is saying. He says, he's saying they can't call on the name of the Lord if they don't know who he is. And sometimes I think maybe in our evangelism, we encourage people to put their faith in a person that they really don't know yet. They really have 
no understanding of him and they'll go through the pattern of praying a prayer and i'm not sure how relevant that is because in my bible it doesn't say if you pray the sinner's prayer you'll be saved in my bible it says whoever calls on the name of the lord shall be saved so this is a response how then shall they call in him on him in whom they have not believed and then he says this and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach unless they are sent as it's written how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace who bring glad tidings of good things and then he says but they have not all obeyed the gospel for isaiah says lord who has believed our report remember believe and faith are almost interchangeable and then Paul adds this comment on this little section. He says, so then faith comes. I'm going to alter it slightly from what you probably have. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. Before there can be genuine faith, there must be the kind of hearing that comes from hearing the word of God. Because genuine faith, is really a response to revelation it's not always a response to information information may be useful and it may be part of the process but genuine faith is response to a revelation it's god when it's when god speaks some truth of some kind maybe it's through a hymn maybe it's through a testimony maybe it's through a preacher in some way and somehow that word arrests you it takes hold of you and you know that this is god making something clear to you and it is really important that at such times we respond we take hold of what god is saying so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of god so if god doesn't speak i mean by revelation and i'm not talking about lights and trumpets or anything exotic in that way and just talking about a truth that comes with power to the inward part of you and me so faith comes by com comes from hearing and hearing through the word of god so here's the process god speaks and because he speaks in a particular way you will hear him if you've never heard him before when god speaks to you you will hear him the old methodists well and i don't know about modern methodists i'm not quite sure what they believe but the old methodists believe passionately in what they call prevenient faith because they believed that it was impossible for a man to repent unless god had spoken to him because if god had spoken to him then there came with the word that god had spoken the power to do what god had commanded God commands all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. But if that doesn't come as a command to the heart, it's not possible for a man just of his own will, just because he has decided it's time he did something about it. It, you, you, it doesn't work like that. It, it must begin with a word from God. And that word, you will know it's from God because you'll hear it. You'll know somehow that God has spoken to you in your circumstance. You'll know that that name that word somehow has your name and address on it you must have heard testimonies along this line where people will say you know, i was in the meeting and someone spoke like this and i it seemed as though i was the only person in the room and a few pers uh, preachers in their time have had people come up to them quite irate quite annoyed and say who's told you my story and the preacher said i don't know your story but what they've heard, of course, is the word of God. And when you hear the word of God, then you must respond because faith is response to revelation that you have heard. Before there can be genuine faith, there must be that kind of hearing that comes from hearing the word, the word of God. Genuine faith is a response to revelation. And you may say, well, 
you know, don't people say, well, you, you must believe and you, you must do this. Well, people say all kinds of things that you must do. Let me read this verse. This is from Matthew chapter 21. Jesus is uh, rebuking people because they ought to have had faith. So if he's holding them accountable for not having faith, it shows that faith is a human response. But it's faith is a human response only when that person has heard the word that God has spoken to them. So this is John chapter, um, sorry, Matthew chapter 1, uh, 21 and verse 21. So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. Well, that sounds like an amazing promise, doesn't it? If you have faith and do not doubt, I'm cutting, I'll cut the bit out of the middle. If you have faith and do not doubt, you can say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and it will be done. Now, as far as I know, this has ne never happened, although I have a sneaking suspicion that one or two people may have tried it at times. And it shows that often our understanding of what faith means is imperfect. It, it's not right because it, faith does not mean I can choose something. I can choose a car that I would like and just pray in faith for this car and be guaranteed because I'm praying in faith that it will come. Remember, faith doesn't begin with you. Faith begins with God. God takes the initiative. You you have to be poised and ready to take hold of what God has said to you. But it's God who stops this process. So it doesn't start by you kind of sitting there or lying there or kneeling there and saying, I'm going to believe God for a mansion. I'm going to believe. I remember a brother well known to many of us who is now with the Lord. And I remember him talking about this, about the whole idea of what they called uh, kind of the word of faith, the idea that you can speak your own word of faith almost and you can speak it and it will happen. Um, name it and claim it or blab it and grab it. They had all kinds of different ways for expressing this thing. And uh, he illustrated it in this way and he said, and these people will tell you, that if you believe, if you have faith, you can have the biggest house on the block. If you have faith, you can have the best car in the street. If you have faith, you can have your bank balance full and overflowing. And then he said, and if that's true, then Jesus had no faith at all. Because he had no house, no car, and no bank balance. And sometimes the simplest you say, way you say things are the way that you remember the best. Remember, brothers and sisters, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. You do not choose what you believe. You choose to believe what God has spoken to you. That's where your choice comes in. That's why if you don't choose what God has said to you, you'll be act held accountable for not believing what God said. OK, let's take at an a look at an illustration. And this is in, in John's Gospel, chapter 3. This is the follow-on from the story with Nicodemus. And uh, this is one of these passages, as I say, where sometimes I'm not sure whether we're reading the words of Jesus. I think the first sentence here is definitely the words of Jesus. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe it if I tell you heavenly things? That's John chapter 3, verse 12. And then this little phrase, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. Now, notice it doesn't say, earth, he says, if I have told you, and, and then he seems to be speaking in the third person, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. Now, is that Jesus speaking, or is that John, by the Spirit, adding Holy Spirit revelation and information? And then this. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent, that's a snake, in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Notice the word believes here now. <clears throat> that whoever believes in him, I'm going to pause for a moment with this word, whoever. What a glorious word this is. There, there is absolutely no one in the whole world who is excluded from this statement. Whoever believes in him. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, how you got there, whose fault it was. If you will put your trust in him, not in an idea. Not in, now I, I believe passionately in the Bible revelation of what they call justification by faith but i am not saved because i believe in the doctrine of justification by faith i am saved because i believe in him because i put my trust in him it's not just th believing things about him it's believing him who has spoken to us that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life and then this glorious golden verse of the bible for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that here he goes again whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for god did not send his son into the world to condemn them actually that's the word judge but we'll leave it for the time being sent into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved now what is what what is the story behind this as moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness there's been no reference to moses in the beginning part of this chapter how did moses come into this story well you know how he came into it because it's one of the stories that all the Jewish boys and girls would have heard from their mother's knee, probably, when they were just a child. It's Numbers chapter 21, and I'm going to read verses 4 to 9. It's all about a bronze snake. It's this time when the people have made the beginnings of their journey, and they are complaining, they're moaning, nothing's right, they... Some of them want to kind of go back to Egypt. Some of them want different food. This stuff that the Bible calls heaven's food, they said it's rubbish. We don't want it. Um, and God, in his faithfulness as a loving father, disciplines them strongly here. But listen how it happens. This is Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Do you know, I've observe something and it's become kind of one of the things i believe in although it didn't come by revelation it's almost impossible to keep a grateful soul down and the opposite is true i have found in many years of seeking to kind of provide pastoral care for individuals it's almost impossible to keep an ungrateful soul up paul says this is how it all went wrong when people went into idolatry they did not honor god as god neither were they thankful thankfulness is such a key part of relationship with god so here they are they're complaining but there's no gratitude they're moaning and then it says so the lord sent fiery serpents snakes among the, the amongst the people, I, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure that anyone else is sure what fiery means in this context. Whether that means that their bite 
was fiery in the sense that the poison that sent into their bloodstream was like a raging fire or whether they were copper colored i i don't know i don't think they were on fire i don't think they were flaming in the sense but here they are let's read on so the lord sent fiery snakes among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of israel died okay so as a result of their sin their ungratitude god has sent this punishment among the people these snakes which when they bit the people many of the people of israel died therefore the people came to moses and said we have sinned that's always a good place to start isn't it when we discover that we've not been grateful and that our ingratitude has led us into trouble therefore the people came to moses and he said and they said we have sinned john in his letter if you remember said if we confess our sins and that's what it says in many bibles but tyndale who was the first person to translate from the greek into the english language the new testament he didn't use the word confess because he knew that if he said confess people would immediately begin to think about the priest and the confessional booth and the priest then absolving them from their sins and he used a word which is much more accurate which is to say the same thing as its homologia which actually means to agree with to acknowledge so 1 john chapter 1 verse 8 i think says this if we acknowledge our sin notice this is a conditional thing here if we acknowledge our sin he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all the righteousness now these are wonderful promises that god will forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all righteousness but it's all conditional it's conditional upon us acknowledging our sin as someone said i don't know who it was who first said this but i like this little aphorism this little saying god cannot change the person you're pretending to be i'll say it again god cannot change the person you're pretending to be we have to come to this place where we acknowledge that we are sinners there's a way this is an old children's chorus there's a way back to god from the dark paths of sin there's a door that has opened and you may go in at calvary's cross is where we begin when we come as a sinner to jesus so here they are they're coming now as sinners people who acknowledge their sin for we have spoken against the lord and against you pray to the lord that he take away the snakes from us so moses prayed for the people i don't know what he prayed for the people because this is what the lord said to moses the lord said to moses make a fiery snake and set it on a pole and it shall be that everyone hallelujah there's that whosoever word again in a different form that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it there's the condition shall live so this is an invitation to the whole wide world but there are conditions that go with it everyone who is bitten you can come but you come as a sinner to jesus and then you must take your eyes off all your inabilities and all your failures and fix them on the lamb of god who bore away the sins of the world including your sins so here in this story from numbers everyone who was bitten when he looks at it shall live so moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and it was if a serpent had bitten anyone then he looked at the bronze serpents he lived that's simple isn't it um all you have to do is what you're told to do and don't add anything to it if you add anything at all to grace you turn it into law and you disqualify yourself 
this is all your eggs in one basket. This is the kind of faith that Blondell did not find amongst the ones who he thought might have volunteered for a trip across to Canada. This, this, this is a different kind of faith that trusts things absolutely to God. You imagine this. I, I have a picture, and I actually have a physical picture in one of the old Bibles that I have by a man named Harold Copping. If you get old Bibles, maybe Victorian era, they often have some beautiful kind of um, colored plates in there. And one of the best was done by a man named Harold Copping, and he produced some wonderful pictures of biblical scenes. And he does this scene. And in the scene, you've got spreading out in the background, you've got, by implication, kind of hundreds of tents vanishing into the distance. Um, and obviously, this is where Israel had camped at that particular place. And then if you look into the foreground, you'll see that there are snakes wriggling around on the floor. And you'll see here and there dotted about there are bodies lying on the floor. And you'll see that there's right in the foreground, there is a young man. And he's been cradled in the arms of his mother. And he's obviously dying. And his father is by the side. And the father is desperately, desperately trying to get this young man to look at the bronze snake on the pole. Because this man believes what God says, that if you look at it, if you look at God's provision for you and for your sin, then you shall live. And it, it, it is such an unmoving picture. I, I, whenever I think of it, I think this is the work of the evangelist. Somehow to get the attention of those who are dying in, in, in their sin as a consequence, not only of what happened in the garden, but because of their own willingness to commit trespasses and to produce their own their own bill, their own list of charges against them. And just to plead with them, not to try any systems. This may sound strange, but I would say, don't even put your trust in Bible verses. Please don't misunderstand me. I believe this book with all my heart. But the book can't save you. I've said this before. Jesus said to the people to whom the book had been given, to the people whose greatest asset, their greatest treasure, was that God had committed to them the oracles of God. He said, you search the scriptures because in them you think you'll find eternal life. And they testify of me and you will not come to me that you might have life. I know people will say the Bible lives, and if you believe this, you'll be saved. Actually, it's not true. It's not just believing the truth. It's putting your trust in a person. It's believing in him. So Moses made a bronze serpent, and put a serpent, a snake, and put it on a pole. And so it was if a serpent had bitten anyone. So there it is. So they had to obey and do what God had said. This, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of put a request in the middle here now for Bob and, and, and Margie, if they can. I don't know. I'm pretty sure you will know in Redemption Hymnal 491. And it's this wonderful hymn by A.B. Simpson, who was the leader of the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada. And it's called I Clasp the Hand of Love Divine. And when we when I finished um if uh, if we can have the words done by that time, I'll, I'll go through the words and show you what a thrilling hymn this is and how he has absolutely captured and hit the head on the nail for how this works in its operation. Okay, so that's 491, Bob and Moggy. I clasp the hand of love divine. I claim the precious promise mine. So this is what is being said 
God is giving us an illustration of the kind of faith that saves because it's not in an idea or a concept or a biblical truth, but it's in God's provision. It's in what God has done. And these these people, anything else you try is just going to be a distraction. If you try to kill the snakes or if you try some homegrown medicine, or some idea, if you try to suck the poison, it, they'll all fail. They'll all fail. There's only one possible cure, one possible remedy for this condition. And that is if they will look away from themselves. You know, in Hebrews, when it says looking unto Jesus, that verb actually means looking away. Looking away to Jesus, looking from everything else, putting your faith in him. Look unto me. And be ye saved, Isaiah prophesied, Jesus would be saying by his death. Okay, now let me say a word or two about prayer and the necessity for faith. You remember that John Wesley said something like this. I've never actually seen the quote, but I've heard various versions of it. And it's something like this, that God will do nothing except an answer to believing prayer. I don't know whether those are the exact words, but I, I, I get the sense of it. I get the essence of what he's saying, and I'm absolutely sure. But prayer can be hindered, and I want to just highlight three examples of way in which prayer can be hindered, blocked, cut down is the word that the Bible sometimes uses, some some process that was going on fine and then it's chopped away and it never comes to its full fruition. Here's one of them. Here's first Peter chapter three and verse seven. Apparently prayer can be hindered by family life. No, you said yes it can. This is Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, that's your wives, according to knowledge, giving honour to the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Well, I don't think you could say it any more clearly than that, could it? That there are certain attitudes which will hinder your prayers. Things that were pro proceeding in the way that God intended them, it's possible for you to have a certain attitude in your family to your wife or from a wife to the husband in some way that will block prayer. Let me tell you an, an illustration. This is an embarrassing illustration, but I will tell you this illustration. At one time, we lived in a big house in Birmingham in England, and uh, we'd bought the house because we were using it as a, as a center for um, our Christian meetings. So we were a house church and uh, it had three stories. And on the bottom story, there was the kitchen and the living rooms. On the next story, there were the bedrooms. And on the top story, there was a, another bathroom, another bedroom and my study right at the top of the house. And because we didn't want to be shouting up and down the stairs all the time, we had a simple um, inter intercom system between where I was and where Margaret was in the kitchen. And on this particular occasion, I think it was maybe kind of fairly mid-morning or something like that. And I was doing, I think, some preparation for a, a message that I was due to give somewhere. And I was working away at it and the intercom rang. And it was Margaret from downstairs. And I've forgotten exactly what she said, but I'll make it up. And it was something like, is it all right if we go to the shops after lunch and get these things that we want to do? And I said, I was angry. I was frustrated. You know, don't you, that frustration is really what happens when I want to be God and circumstances won't let me. When I want to be in control, when I want to say my will be done and I don't get away with it. And then I feel this thing that we call frustration. But I was frustrated. And I said, love, I'm busy. You know, I've got this thing to prepare for tonight. And I'm busy. You know, 
this isn't important. And she said, oh, okay, it's okay, we'll talk about it later. So she put the phone down and I put the phone down and downstairs in the kitchen, she went back to her cooking, singing her hymns, which she sings most of the day when she's cooking and doing about the house, singing the hymns. And I was upstairs and I gave myself to prayer and to the studying of the scriptures and heaven was like brass. And I couldn't pray. It would have been, I don't know, it would have been just almost blasphemous to pray when I knew that I, I, I could not come to God with this attitude of frustration. So I went downstairs and I confessed to my lovely, gracious wife and I said, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord, I shouldn't have uh, love, I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. And she said, oh, I never noticed it. <laughs> love doesn't notice a lot of things, you know. Um, if we're critical and super critical, we notice all kinds of things that love would never notice. But but she didn't notice it. But I learned something. I learned that um, prayer can be hindered if our attitudes are wrong. Here's another instance in which attitudes can be wrong. This time I'm reading from 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. And Paul is um, talking about the way in which we are to be submissive in our disposition to the authorities that God has placed, but at the same time to know that there are limits on human authority. And if God has said something and they bring in a law which says you can't do it, then you break the law and you pay the price, whatever it is. So that's what Paul and uh, Peter, Paul and Peter kind of touch these topics in different ways. So in First Timothy chapter two, verse eight, it says this: "I will." That's Paul expressing his desire. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath. Well, let's pause there for a minute. Did you know that if you're angry, it will hinder your prayers? Did you know that? You see, these inward dispositions make faith, which is utter dependence upon God, really impossible. So lifting up holy hands without wrath. Maybe you don't like the government. Maybe you don't like the prime minister or whatever it is in your particular country. Maybe you didn't vote for him. Are you angry with him? Well, you're disqualified from praying for him. You're to be submissive to the authority that God has put in their place. But at the same time, not to bow the knee to that that God has forbidden. So, if you have a wrong attitude, if you're angry, if you're seething because he's put up the taxes or he's done something to the school system, whatever it is, beware, brothers and sisters. When we pray, we need to be able to pray with a good conscience. And if our conscience is in any way disturbed, it will disturb the way that we pray. And how about this one? You probably, some of you, would have learned this verse from faithful pastors and teachers when you were in your teenage years. It's from Psalm 66 and verse 18, and it's brief and very much to the point. Here it is. Psalm 68, verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I don't know how much clearer that could be expressed either. Understand that prayer that is to be heard, that is based on revelation even, has to come with people whose disposition is right before God. That's why it is so wonderful that if we acknowledge our sin, I believe, I believe that God intends us to live without sin. John wrote and said, these things I've written to you that you do not sin. I believe that God has given us all things necessary that we do not sin. I also believe that 
if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So God has built in an emergency measure. Um, but this whole passage begins really in verse 8 of the first, previous chapter, I think it is, where it says, if we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you can start absolutely fresh. Okay, one last little section, very briefly. This is, how do we progress in the things of God? How do we grow in grace? How do we go from faith to faith? You know, there are little phrases in the scripture, there are three of them that I think are really very telling. And the scripture speaks at one point from grace to grace. It also speaks about from faith to faith, and it speaks from glory to glory. That is progress. That is, it, it, it isn't all immediate. As you grow, so your capacity grows, and so God has more for you. So this is Second Peter this time, chapter 1 and verse 2. And he says this, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What an astonishing promise this is, and what a revelation that God has given to us exceeding great and precious promise. Of course, God could just have done the thing without you being part of it. That would have been a dehumanizing process because God is determined that he will do in your life what he wants to do in your life with your full-hearted consent, with your amen. Abraham believed God. The Hebrew is the amen God, you have to give your full-hearted consent for it really to be faith. But look at this thing. He has given to his exceeding great and precious promises. Why has he done that? Well, he, he's done that because he does, this isn't a production line, you see. He just doesn't want to get to the end of the, the, end of the, 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 the belt so that someone can put a stamp on it and say, that's it, it's perfect. God is interested in relationship. That's why I love the truth of the new covenant. God is out for covenant. He's not, he provides wonderful big bang experiences, but they're all steps towards covenant because he wants to be in a relationship with us. That's why we were made. And that's why you get this idea of walking with the Lord so often throughout the scriptures exceeding great and precious promises as God revealed his will to you in a promises I mean in the sense that you've been reading something and maybe it's been come as a command maybe it's come as an instruction that you should husbands love your wives as Christ loved the, your church and you think oh help if he'd said do your best I would have struggled but when he says love your wives as Christ loved the church that I'm, that's hopeless, I don't stand a chance. Well, if God speaks it to your heart, you'll discover that something in you will hear it. You'll hear the word that God speaks, and then you must embrace it. You must believe that you can do what you couldn't do. God's enabling promise came, power came with that promise. If you take him in his word, he will fulfill that promise in you. Do you remember that wise word from Elizabeth that she passed on to Mary when Mary had received the news that she was going to be a virgin bearer of a child? And she said to Mary, blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, if you believe 
what God has spoken to you, not what you've made up for yourself or even what a book has told you unless God has spoken through the book. But if you have believed, there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told you by the Lord. Here's a story I love, just as an illustration. I've almost finished now. This comes later on in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 10. And it's the story about a man with a withered hand. Remember this? Uh, he's in the presence of Jesus, and he has this withered hand. And the people who are watching are watching, ready to pounce, because it's the Sabbath day. And so what they want is to see him doing a work, a miraculous work on the Sabbath day. And then they can pounce and say, well, in that case, how could he possibly be the Messiah? Because he's sinning. This is how the story goes. And uh, I'm just, I just, I've gone to the last verse here. And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. Now, this is a word that Jesus speaks to this man. And this man received it. You may have heard that this man was healed because of the faith of four of his friends. But I have a, an old friend who is now with the Lord. He used to say it was the faith of five because you, you need the willing consent of God for these things to take part. When they believed, they believed, and four of them carried the willing person into the present Jesus. Uh, that and the roof. But in this instance, stretch out your hand. He's speaking to him. And then it says, and he did so. But imagine this situation. This is his right hand. I'm presuming that he's been using his left hand for a long time. And Jesus says to him, stretch out your hand. I, I don't know whether the thought went through his mind. Did he think, you don't understand, that's my problem. My, my, my right hand is withered. It, it doesn't work. I can't stretch it out. Did he think, I, I just can't do it. It, doesn't, it won't work like that. My right hand will not do what I tell it to do. Stretch out your hand. And he did so. In the microsecond between Jesus saying, stretch out your hand, and him beginning to do it, a miracle took place. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Wonderful. So there are hindrances to prayer. It is by faith. We are not saved by grace. We are saved by grace through faith. And we're not saved through grace. We're saved by grace through faith. Grace is God's provision. Faith is our enabled response to God. But it's an enabled response. It's not a forced response. Choose you this day what you will do. Bob, are we in any condition to sing I clasp the hand of love divine? That's fine, Ron. Do we have the words too? I think Alex has got them, yeah. And on the we, screen, yeah. Could we sing that? If we have them up on the screen, and I'll just talk to you briefly, and then we can sing it. Mm. Okay, so it's in the chat, isn't it? That's right. Okay. I love this hymn. Here it is. I This is A.B. Simpson. A.B. Simpson is the man who was responsible for the phrase, the four square gospel. And for him, it was Jesus as savior, healer, uh, baptizer in the spirit and coming king. I clasp the hand of love divine. I claim the gracious promise mine. And add to his, my countersign, I take, he undertakes. Now, 
this is a, a historical anomaly in the UK because I was a bank clerk back in the 1950s and they stopped making it necessary for someone to countersign a check in the bank. So in England, we have not needed to countersign checks for over 50 years now. But in America, I think, if a check is made payable to you, you're required to resign it on the bank as a kind of a receipt and an acknowledgement that you are receiving this fund and then it can go into your account or it can be cashed. And he's using that image here and he's saying, I clasp the hand of love divine. Now, if you can see my hands, I don't know whether this is going to work because I, I always go the wrong way. That's it. There's something called the fireman's clasp. Um, can you see that? It, it isn't that the, you're holding your hand like this. It's it's like this. It's a mutual clasp. I clasp the hand of love divine. I claim the gracious promise of mine. I add to his my countersign. I take, he undertakes. So God has done everything necessary. He's written out the check. He's put your name on it. He's put it in your hand. And all you have to do is believe what he has said to you and add to his your countersign. All these checks have to have two signatures on them. God's on the front and yours on the back. <laughs> I'm just I'm just illustrating the story. And then this lovely chorus. I take thee, blessed Lord, I give myself to thee. And thou, according to thy word, dost undertake for me. And then he works his way through. I take salvation, full and free, through him who gave his life to me. He undertakes my all to be. I take, he undertakes. I take him as my holiness my spirit's spotless heavenly dress. I take the Lord, my righteousness. I take, he undertakes. I take the promised Holy Ghost. I take the power of Pentecost to fill me to the uttermost. I take, he undertakes. I take him for this mortal frame. I take my healing through his name. And all his risen life I claim, I take, he undertakes. Can we sing this, Bob, please? I clasp the hand of love divine. I claim the gracious promise mine. And add to his my countersign, I take. He undertake, I take the blessed Lord, I give myself to Thee, and Thou, according to Thy word, dost undertake for me. I take salvation full and free through him who gave his life for me he undertakes my all to be i take he undertakes i take the blessed lord i give myself to thee and thou according to thy word dost undertake for me i take him as my holiness my spirit spotless heavenly dress i take the lord my righteousness I take, he undertakes. I take, he blessed Lord. I give myself to thee. 
and thou according to thy word dost undertake for me I take the promised Holy Ghost I take the power of Pentecost to fill me to the uttermost I take the undertake I take the blessed Lord I give myself to thee and thou according to thy word dost undertake for me I take him for this mortal frame I take my healing through his name and all his risen life I claim I take he undertake I take the blessed Lord I give myself to thee and thou according to thy word dost undertake for me I take the promised Holy Ghost I take the power of Pentecost to fill me to the uttermost I take the undertake I take the blessed Lord I give myself to thee and thou according to thy word dost undertake for me I take salvation full and free through him who gave his life for me he undertakes my all to be I take the undertake I take the blessed Lord I give myself to thee and thou according to thy word dost undertake for me Seeding great and precious promises there they are father we bless you for this full salvation we thank you lord that you are determined to save us to the uttermost and we bless you lord for the fullness of it and we pray lord that if we are conscious of any lack in any part of your salvation that you lord you will speak a word to our heart reminding us of your faithful promise that if we embrace if we take if we count aside if we take hold of what you have promised lord there will be a fulfillment of that that you have promised I pray, Lord, for each one of us, not knowing the circumstance of any, not even my own in reality, but praying, Lord, that you will bring to my knowledge any area whereof I have need of thee and need of thy precious promise. And take me, Lord, step by step, moment by moment and promise by promise into all your fullness. And for all of us, I pray, Lord. Amen.